Good morning. Welcome to this new experience that we will have in the following days. Because of the new situation, so let us have also this new response. So we will be having our online retreat. And uh, this morning, I will be giving you the orientation on the online retreat. First, I will try to give the genesis, the reason, the why for this retreat. Then also give you some uh, indications, tips on how we can make this retreat well. And then also a hint about the topic that we will be having during this retreat. Hopefully, this will be not only an experience, but a spiritual experience for all of us. And uh, for this first talk, I have selected a passage from the prophet Ezekiel. And it reads, As for you, son of man, your people are talking about you beside the walls and in the doorways of your houses. They say to one another, Let's go hear the latest word that comes from the Lord. My people come to you, gathering as a crowd and sitting in front of you to hear your words, but they will not act on them. Love songs are on their lips, but in their hearts they pursue dishonest gain. For them, you are only a singer of love songs, with a pleasant voice and clever touch. They listen to your words, but they do not obey them. Hopefully, what the prophet Ezekiel has said about the people of Israel does not happen to us during this online retreat that people are excited to hear what the prophet would say. So they speak in their houses and in the walls, and they say, Come, let us listen. Let us hear the latest word from the prophet. But then, their intention is probably just to be entertained, listening to love songs listening to pleasant new ideas, but they have no intention to obey the word, to put the word into practice. Their heart is not in listening and being open to the Lord. Hopefully, that does not happen to us during this retreat. That you've turned on to this online retreat to say, to see, is there anything new? What good ideas can we get? What will Bishop Broderick will say? But then there is no intention of being in touch with the Lord. Let us pray that this does not happen to us. We have entitled this retreat, Pentecostes because we are nearing the time of the Pentecost. And hopefully, there will be the opening up of our churches by the time of the Pentecost, little by little, yes, with restrictions. Pentecostes, from crisis to renewal, we have undergone the crisis, the crisis of the quarantine, and many for many of us, this has been really a crisis. No, a crisis of relationships, a crisis of uh, finances, a crisis of our plans, and maybe, maybe a crisis of faith. But may this crisis bring us to renewal, that we can come out of this situation renewed, from lockdown to mission. We have been locked down, unable to move. But now that little by little we'll be able to go out, 
hopefully it's not just to enjoy ourselves, but we go out to mission. So this will be the theme of the retreat. Pentecostes, from crisis to renewal, from lockdown to mission. Now, what are the reasons for this retreat? Why do we make this retreat and at this time? First, it was thought to be an online retreat as a substitute for the yearly annual retreat of the Archdiocese of Manila. We usually set our retreat during the month of July. But this year, most likely, it will not take place. We are not sure about the situation. By the month of July, probably we will not yet be allowed to have large gatherings. And many of our priests, because of the situation of the lockdown, have a lot of things to attend to. So, this is not probable, not possible. So, we conceptualize to have this retreat as a substitute and only for the priests of Manila. But then, being online, we thought it could be good to open it to all the other priests not only the priests of Manila. So we have our guest priests. We have the religious priests who are working in Manila. We have also the religious sisters working with us. And uh, we have the lay leaders in the archdiocese. So being online, there's no point of just limiting it just for us. Let us limit to all the workers the pastoral workers working in Manila. But then, looking at our platform, what we can use, we have to decide, should we use the Zoom meeting or other uh, platform with the internet? But our problem with the internet is that many of our own parishes do not have reliable internets. So we have decided to use the broadcast platform that is to, through TB Maria, through Radio Veritas, and then can be taken on by the Facebook of uh, for Facebook pages of our own parishes. So now being in the broadcast platform, it is open to all. Anybody can tune in. Now, it has a problem for me. To whom would I focus? If it were just for the priests of Manila, then I would focus my talks to the priests or just to the archdiocese, our concerns of the archdiocese. But it has gone wider. And even the language, if it were just for the Manila clergy, then I could speak in Tagalog. But now that we open it to all, we have also our own guest priests who don't know Tagalog. So I have also to make the choice of speaking in English. But there are also opportunities that I can take to speak in Tagalog if it would express more the ideas that we want to say. Now, why at this time? Why now? Somehow, this time is uh, the last leg of the quarantine. So, the last leg, we still don't know what the AITF will tell us, they continually meet. But we know that uh, should be ending. They are now minamaluwag na 
no, ang mga limitasyon sa atin. And we can still find time to set aside for such a spiritual exercise. Being still in a quarantine period, lockdown pa tayo. So we can still have time to set aside and hopefully we set aside our time. And not only that we set aside our time, it is also a good time to evaluate what has happened to us individually and as church during this long time of quarantine and covering the seasons of Lent and Easter, very strong moments in the life of the church. So it's good to evaluate. You know, this is a unique experience. And I don't think that this experience hopefully will happen again. So it's good to see how have we fared during this experience and especially during the time of Lent and Easter. And also we prepare ourselves spiritually to enter a new chapter in our life and in our ministry. We will not be going back to what we had been doing last February. This is something new. And hopefully we are prepared to meet this challenge spiritually. So many adaptations will happen. Let us meet this new situation with optimism and courage. Yes, we will not be able to do what we had been doing before, but let us not cling to the past. We know that the Lord is always present. He is the Emmanuel. He is journeying with us. So let us allow ourselves to be guided by the Spirit. He is also leading us during this time. So it's not only a time to look back on what happened. It's also a time to look forward to what awaits us. And let us strengthen ourselves spiritually with the proper attitudes in order to meet the Lord where He is asking us to go. Let us take this uh, saying of John Paul II to the bishops of Oceania. He said, To be combated is ecclesial introversion. Just looking at ourselves. Self-referential retreat into comfort zones. Pastoral pessimism. Sterile nostalgia for the past. So we have to combat this. So we want to have, to have our fiesta as before. No, maybe all the church activities as before. Mabuti pa noon, nagagawa natin ito. And we see that we will be less effective now with this new situation. And what can help us to combat this introversion? This retreating into the comfort zone is the sense of mission. That's why from lockdown to mission, the Pope said, all renewal in the church must have mission as its goal if it's not to fall prey to a kind of ecclesial introversion. Sense of mission, not only doing what we had been doing before, so this was St. John Paul II. But also, Pope Francis has something to say to us about this. And he said that in uh, Evangelii Gaudium. Pastoral ministry in a missionary, mo, missionary key seeks to abandon the complacent attitude that says, we've always done it this way. So he says, I invite everyone to be bold and creative in this task of rethinking the goals, structures, style, and methods of evangelization in their respective communities. Of course, Evangelii Gaudium was written many years ago 
in 2013. But we can apply it to our time. It's true. We have to rethink the goals now with the new situation, the new and hopefully better normal that we have. New structures probably we have to create or to let go of old structures, styles no, of uh, reaching out to the people and methods of evangelization. So let us not just cling to the past. We have done it before. This was how we did our Simbang Gabi. This is how we did our retreats before, our recollections. Iba na ang panahon natin ngayon. And we say that this is a serendipitous moment sa a confluence of happy, we'd say, chances or providence that we have this retreat at this moment. We can all pray together. Pray together in our homes, in our convents. Pray together as an archdiocese. Since we make this retreat as an archdiocese, we can pray together with all the other people that will join us, that are joining us uh, in our spiritual exercise. And then, with this retreat, we can have a common orientation through the common talks that we hear and we can reflect on these together. This is especially true for the priests. It's good that as priests in the Archdiocese, we can have a common orientation. Let us evaluate what we've been doing. And also in the Archdiocese with, the, with our own pastoral workers. And hopefully, this can help us come out of this dark experience enlightened and renewed. In God's economy of salvation, nothing is wasted. Even the most inglorious suffering and death on the cross became the stepping stone to life and glory. So even what is bad can be a stepping stone for a greater good. So yes, we have suffered. Our plans have been uh, curtailed by the lockdown, by this virus, the economy has suffered. But there's also something good here that we can maximize. So we go out from this experience enlightened and renewed rather than discouraged and despondent. And hopefully this retreat can bring us out. We also hear from the prophet Ezekiel. Thus says the Lord God, Look, I am going to open your graves. I will make you come out of your graves, my people, and bring you back to the land of Israel. You shall know that I am the Lord when I open your graves and when you come out of them, my people. Yes, it is an experience. We are going out of our graves, being locked down in space. And God is telling us and leading us you know, to be the new Israel. That's why this retreat is a good timing you know, for that, a perfect timing. More or less, it is the time of the Pentecost the time of sending forth from our upper rooms, from our rooms, from our houses, where we have been in hiding, and mostly because of fear. The apostles, the Christians were hiding because of the fear of the Jews, because the fear that Jesus is no longer with them. But we have been hiding in our own uh, homes, convents, because of the fear of the virus or because of the fear of the police or the barangay that can catch us. 
So this will be our Pentecost experience, going out of our graves, going out where we have been cooped up during this time. And also, we will be entering now the ordinary time in the calendar of the church. So we have passed through the violet season of Lent. We have passed through the yellow or white color of Easter. We go back to the green color of ordinary time. We start to build up again our ordinary lives after these extraordinary eight weeks. So this is the timing for the retreat. How do we enter into our ordinary lives? So you see that nothing is wasted in God's economy. Now, how do we make the retreat? Is this still a retreat? Maybe it's the first time, yes, for all of us to have an online retreat. We have known of retreats going to a particular place outside of our homes, outside of our schools, to have a new ambient. But now, in our own rooms, we make the retreat. Hopefully, this can bring about an experience of encountering the Lord. So what do we do in order to make this a retreat? What does a retreat require? In the retreat, we are asked to listen. Yes, we listen to the inputs. The inputs can be given by the speaker. Now, I am giving the inputs. The inputs can be given by a page in a book or a page in the Bible. So let us listen. Let us try to understand. But more than is listening to the speaker, more than listening to me, it's good that we have the attitude of listening to ourselves. In fact, the talks are just meant to be trigger points that can lead us into deeper reflections. So we don't come to the retreat just to listen to the talks, to the conferences. So we cannot make a retreat without moments of reflection, delving into ourselves, diving into ourselves, to know ourselves better. And especially to listen to God. God is speaking. He continually sends His signal. Only that many times we are preoccupied with so many things that we fail to catch His signal. So during the retreat, we set up our antennas to listen to God. So, listening. The Hebrew Bible has a special word for listening. And a very important word in the Bible, and that is Shema. Let us listen or watch to this video that could explain to us the meaning of the Shema. For thousands of years, every morning and evening, Jewish people have prayed these well-known words as a way of expressing their devotion to God. They're called the Shema. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one. And as for you, you shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, and with all of your strength. Now the first word of the Shema is hear or listen, which in Hebrew is pronounced Shema. That's where the prayer gets its name. Now Shema is a really common word in the Hebrew Bible, and it's obvious why. Hearing is a very universal activity. It's usually connected with the ear, as in Proverbs chapter 20, ears that Shema and eyes that see 
The Lord has made them both. Now that seems basic enough, but if you look at the other ways that Hebrew authors can use the word Shema, they use it to mean more than just let sound waves enter your ear. In Hebrew, Shema can also mean pay attention to or focus on. So when Leah, who wasn't loved by her husband Jacob, she has a son and she names him Simon, or in Hebrew, Shimon, because she says, the Lord has Shamad, that I am unloved. So Shema means to hear and to pay attention to and even more. It can also mean responding to what you hear. This is why so many of the cries for help in the book of Psalms begin with a call that God listen. Psalm 27 verse 7, Shema my voice when I call, O Lord, be merciful, answer me. So asking God to Shema is at the same time asking God to act, to do something. It's similar to when God asks people to listen. Like when the people of Israel come to Mount Sinai, God says, If you shema me fully and keep my covenant, then out of all the nations you will be my treasured possession. Now there's a couple interesting things about this verse in Exodus. In Hebrew, the word shema is repeated twice in this sentence to give it emphasis. If you shema shema, meaning listen closely. But also notice that from God's point of view, listening is basically the same as keeping the covenant. So when God asks the people to Shema, what he means is that they listen and obey. And that's the last fascinating thing about Shema. In ancient Hebrew, there is no separate word for obey, meaning to carry out the wishes of someone who knows better than you or is in authority over you. So in the Bible, if you want to say, I will listen and do what you say, you use the single word Shema. In Hebrew, listening and doing are two sides of the same coin. This is why later in Israel's history, when the people were breaking their covenant promises to God, the Hebrew prophets would say things like, they have ears, but they're not listening. The Israelites, of course, could hear just fine, but they weren't actually listening or else they would act differently. And so in the end, listening in the Bible is about giving respect to the one speaking to you and doing what they say. Real listening takes effort and action. And that's the Hebrew word Shema. So what attitude should we have as we enter into this retreat? Let us be reminded of these important things and uh, let us pray that we have these attitudes. First, a conviction that God wants to speak with us and that He has many things to tell us. Our God is not a secretive God. Our God is not silent. He is a revealing God. He wants to speak. He wants to communicate. He's the Word. And uh, let us open ourselves to Him, especially in the retreat. That's why the time of the retreat is we shut off all the other things that we can pay more attention to God, what God will tell us. So openness to God through silence and prayer. Be generous in giving Him these four days. Let us give Him the silence and prayer. Set aside all the other concerns that you do. The lockdown has told us that we can set aside things that before we thought were so important. So even now, can we just offer to God these four days just for Him? And one big challenge for us is to shut off our social communications. No, so that we can communicate with God. Saint Anselm, who lived about 1,200 years ago, has said, Insignificant man, escape from your everyday business for a short while. Hide for a moment from your restless thoughts. Break off from your cares and troubles and be less concerned about your tasks and labors. Make a little time for God and rest a while in Him. 
how good this is to us. It applies to us. The world of St. Anselm was very slow. That was 1,200 years ago. And yet, people then were already busy with their daily concerns. How much more today? Even if we are in the quarantine period, our time flew, our time flies. Watching he this, watching that, listening to this, listening to that, no meetings there, meetings here. So that's why let us escape from all of this for a while. Be generous to God to listen to Him. Every encounter is personal. We can be sure that God wants to encounter us personally. Are we ready to meet Him? There are activities that can facilitate this encounter with God. And these are ordinary activities that we do during that retreat, which we can still do also during this online retreat. The Holy Eucharist is an important encounter with Him for us priests and for the religious in the convents. They have the Eucharist. For the lay people, we also offer the Eucharist online. So let us continue and hopefully pray the Eucharist well. Second encounter is the confession. Let us make it a point to confess during this retreat. So we will have a common penitential service on Wednesday afternoon to help us to make a good confession. Among the priests, they can confess to one another. Or they can also, the priests can go to the convents of religious sisters and offer the service of confession. And the lay people can come to the parish, not together, no, one by one. And I ask the priests that they make themselves available to hear the confessions of the lay people. It's good that we can have this common renewal of the whole church of Manila and all the other churches with the sacrament of confession. Personal prayer. And here I think we can set aside time for personal prayer. You have your own personal prayers, favorite prayers, but I would say, can we have one hour of solid prayer every day? One hour of solid prayer now we can uh, use our own cell phone to have the timing now that we can have one hour of prayer set aside for the Lord, that we can encounter Him. Another thing that we can do is the Bible. At least 30 minutes reading what passages you want, passages of the day, or uh, texts coming from uh, a favorite book of the Bible. And we can use the Lectio Divina. And uh, I will tell you what how Lectio Divina can be used. You know that the church promotes Bible reading. That if we read the Bible 30 minutes a day prayerfully, we can gain a plenary indulgence with the useful conditions, of course. The church promote this. And then we have these talks. And as I've said, the talks can lead to further reflections. The talks are meant to lead us to deeper knowledge of ourselves and our own ministries. And the talks will just be de dealing with uh, ordinary things, but very important things. And many times, because you're so ordinary, 
we have lost track of their importance. So, you don't make the, the talk by, by the retreat by just listening to the talks. But these are, as I've said, trigger points that can lead us to deeper reflection. So, it's not just enough to listen to them. In all this, we need silence. Silence is so important. We already have, probably in our convents, in our churches, no, the capacity for external silence. People don't come to the church offices anymore. In our homes, I don't know how silent are your homes. But what is the great so source of noise for us now is the internet, the TV, the radio, the social means of communication. Can we fast from this during these four days? Four days lang naman. Hindi naman masyadong mahaba. Can we do without them? Use them only for this retreat and no more. Cut them off. I don't think the world will change much in four days if you're not able to keep track of what's happening. So, yan ang pakiusap to promote this interior silence. Again, let us listen to Saint Anselm who tells us, Enter into your mind's inner chamber. Shut up everything but God and whatever helps you to seek Him. And when you have shut the door, look for Him. Speak now to God and say with your whole heart, I seek your face. Your face, Lord, I desire. Let us pray this. And pray this constantly. It can be even a refrain, a mantra that we can use during these days. I seek your face, your face, Lord, I desire. You know, you can use your one hour of prayer just repeating this you know, as a mantra and entering into this situation. Silence is so important that Meister Eckhart, again, you know, a master of spirituality of the Middle Ages, said, Nothing resembles God so much as silence. Nothing resembles God so much as silence. We see how life grows, comes out of silence. The whole universe expands in silence. The whole forest grows in silence. We have grown in the womb of our mothers in silence. We have made our studies in the silence of our rooms. There is life. There is energy in silence. Let us experience this silence. Also, St. Ignatius of Antioch wrote, a father of the church. A word uttered by the father. He was his son. He always speaks in eternal silence. And in silence, he must be heard. He's speaking of Jesus, the word of God, who was with the father from the very beginning. And all creation was made through this word. He speaks in eternal silence. And in silence, he is accepted. He is heard. One of the lessons we learned from the lockdown is to look for and experience the essentials. We have come to terms with this. That's why we have seen only our essential needs. We don't have much money. 
So we have to see what are essential needs. We don't have to, we cannot go to the mall to buy things and many times things that are not needed. We have also gone through essential relationships. No longer with friends, but now we are locked down with the people in our community for the religious, with our own families, family members. So we are reduced to the bare minimum in our relationships. Of course, with the social media, we can have many friends, but those that whom, to whom we are in touch with the real relationships, reduce the bare essentials. We also have gone to our essential expenses. So we cannot buy things because the shops are closed, but at the same time, we don't have much money. So we try to see, is this really needed? Or luxurious na yan? Now that we are about to start opening up the quarantine, in order to avoid any second wave of the infections, people are cautious. That's why they open up only the essentials. Again, pinag-uusapan na naman ang essential. Mahalaga ba talaga yan? So, they open up essential services. And this is something that we are fighting for to consider religious activities as essential services. They should not lump up the religious activities with concerts, with movies. If we want to build a resilient people, if we have, want to have resilient minds and psychology, we need God. We need these religious experiences. So they're opening up essential services. They're opening up essential workforce. While the rest can stay at home. What are the essential workforce that we need to go to the office? We have also essential activities. So, what are the activities that we need to do? Buy and sell? Going to the restaurant? Is it essential? Or we just get the food and cook in our houses? So, the experience of the quarantine we, has made us come to terms with the essentials. In the church, we are also identifying the essentials in our ministry and worship. How far can we go trimming down our practices without sacrificing the ministry to the people and even the validity of our works? Yes, we can have online mass. But the online mass is not the same as being truly present no, in, with the community, in uh, the church. We have online blessings, but it's different to have the blessings really coming from the Lord with the priest there. Some even are asking for online confession. <laughs> Can we do that? No, online confession. That's why we see, we see what are the borders, what are the limitations when we go to trim down to the essentials. So when we are asked now to open up our own churches for religious activities, let us go back to the essentials. As we have said in our instruction, yung mga abay, essential ba sa kasal? Pwede naman tayong magkasal na walang mga abay. Yung maraming ninong at ninang, essential ba sa binyang? No, the essential is just uh, one or two. No, godparents. 
So, yan. We have to go back to the essentials. So, also in the talks, I will be speaking about the essentials in our ministry as church. So, the topics that I will be dealing with are very simple topics. But they have been given to us by St. John Paul II in his document, Novo Milenio Inuente, given at the Epiphany of 2001. Remember, there was the great jubilee of the year 2000. So there were a lot of indulgences, no, celebrations. But after the year 2000, when we enter the third millennium, the Pope is reminding us, what do we do now? How are we to continue the fruits of the jubilee? And the, the, the Holy Father reminds us about the pastoral priorities that we have to take. So we have the pastoral priorities for the church for the third millennium. Let us take these seven pastoral priorities that the Holy Father has told us. We are just 20 years in the new millennium. Millennium, that's 1,000 years. We are just at the very beginning. So we are just 20 years with the millennium. So what the Pope said is very valid for us, starting still at the start of the new millennium. We read this from uh, St. Paul. Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. In all circumstances, give thanks. For this is the will of God for you in Christ Jesus. This is the will of God for you. Rejoice always. Rejoice always. Even in this situation of difficulties, we can find reasons for joy. Pray without ceasing. Pray always. And especially this, in all circumstances, give thanks. We can give thanks in all circumstances because God is there in all circumstances. So we can ask ourselves, what can we thank the Lord for in this pandemic? Is there something that we can thank the Lord? If we go deeply, there are also many benefits that this pandemic has given to us. What can we thank the Lord for? First, we have come in touch with the poor. Strange, but for us in the ministry, especially for the priests, we have come in touch with the poor during the lockdown. We have gone out to them and many priests probably have realized, ang dami palang mahihirap sa aming parokya. How so? Because of our distributions of 1.3 billion worth of gift certificates, reaching more than 6.8 million individuals, and the more than 100 million worth in cash and kinds reaching more than 665,000 individuals. Besides those, the one that we reach with our GCs. And these have been distributed. Of course, not only in the Archives of Manila, but uh, with the help of Caritas Manila, has reached 10 dioceses in the Metro Manila area. But that's a, that's a big amount. And a large number of people that we have reached, we have come in touch with them. Because of this pandemic, we are sheltering more than 450 street people in six institutions. And that for already six months. Sheltering them, feeding them every day, telling them stories, giving them information. And these are street people. 
who probably we don't mind during the ordinary times. But we, we have come deeply in touch with them. During this time, because of lodging, we have come in touch with the poor because of lodging more than 800 medical and military frontliners in 28 schools, parishes, hostels, and convents in the Archdiocese of Manila. And I'm sure all the other dioceses, dioceses have their own stories to tell. So they come to our convents, to our schools, to our hostels because they could not go back to their own families. And even some in their own communities are afraid of them. But we have lodged them and sometimes even feeding them. We've come in touch with the poor. And we've come in touch with the poor because of the help given to many people who come to our churches and convents for help. And truly, many are in dire difficulties, are already hungry. It's good that they can come to our churches and we help them. Kayo may magtatanong, ano bang ginagawa ng simbahan? Ang dami. And so many people are grateful. And we help not only Catholics, not only Christians, anyone who is in need. Ano man ang kanilang affiliation or religion. So this is a grace that we have during this lockdown. We thank the Lord. And hopefully, now that we have come in touch with the poor and the poor have come in touch with us, we can continue this relationship with them. Pope Francis has said in Evangelii Gaudium, The parish should be the church living in the midst of the homes of her sons and daughters. This presumes that it is really in contact with the homes and lives of its people and does not become a useless structure out of touch with the people or a self-absorbed group made up of a chosen few. And somehow because of this experience of the lockdown, although our churches are closed, yet we have gone out to them. We have come in touch with the lives of our own people. Another thing that we can thank the Lord for, we had more time to pray, to read the scriptures, to do some serious readings, to, read, to be with the people who are around us in our homes, in our convents. Unfortunately, there might have been times that our homes have just become hostels. We just come to eat and to sleep. But had no contact and probably we didn't meet each other. But now we had more time. Hopefully, we don't say during this time of the pandemic, I could not pray because I have no time to pray. We have a lot of time. It's just a matter of prioritizing. To read to be in touch with the Bible. Let us thank the Lord for this gift of time that we've experienced during the pandemic. We have connected with more people through online masses and other online services. Let us thank the Lord for this. We have seen that probably many people who didn't know the church, have known the church better through these online services. And hopefully this can continue after that. We ourselves, especially we priests and we religious, have discovered the internet as a way of reaching out to our people through these online services. For me personally, the first time that I've been touched with uh, online meetings through the school, uh, the Zoom, the Skype, Jitsi, and so many other flow of, uh, formats to meet people face to face, at least seeing their faces, 
no during this so we've seen also the interconnectivity because of these services this is something that we should thank the lord for we also thank the lord that we have been able to live more simply kaya naman palang walang malls without eating out without travels without engagements which keep, keep us away and running from place to place it's possible to live more simply so another lifestyle we have experienced cooking together telling stories working together praying together no, having enough time to sleep no, have the leisure of eating slowly home home cooked foods this is a new experience we thank the lord for this so i just pointed out some things that could bring out optimism in us that even in this experience the lord is with us i know you have your own other experiences that's why i would ask you to pause for a moment to write down your own positive realizations from this experience of the tomb the quarantine by the way this is one thing that i recommend have also your own notebooks to write down your thoughts i know that this is online so the talks are available to you you can download them later on and re still reflect on them but your own ideas that come out of these talks write them down and when you write them down you own them you own these ideas so you can uh, have your thoughts written down as we play this music no, soothing music for three minutes for you and then not only that I also ask you to write down the defects the anger the fear the loneliness that have been magnified by this lockdown identify them confront them and be sorry for them write them down let us identify our demons which have been magnified during this time that's why we need confession so that we can uh, be sorry for our own sinfulness because unfortunately even within our houses sin is still lurking around us the devil is always working so let us confront him deny him and be sorry if we have fallen again let us take time now with the soft music there in order to write them down and as we end this first talk I'd like you to have this short sentence addressed to you. God speaking, we need to talk. 